Hello, my name is Dr. Okiri Richard. I'm continuing our podcast on basic cardiology. This is actually the part two of the 3.17 increasing dyspnea and tiredness, which is talking about mitral stenosis. Uh, let me recap the grading of the mitral valve stenosis. Light, a mild light mitral valve stenosis has a middle gradient of less than 5 mm of mercury with an opening area of more than 1.5 cm squared. Moderate mitral valve stenosis had a middle gradient of 5 to 10 mm of mercury and an opening area between 1 to 1.5 cm squared. And a severe mitral valve stenosis has a gradient of more than 10 mm of mercury and an opening area of less than 1.0 cm squared. Don't forget this opening area is measured through the formula uh, gotten through dividing the 220 over the pressure half time. So now, what symptoms you would expect for a patient with mitral valve stenosis are reduced exercise tolerance, exertional dyspnea, dyspnea at rest, sometimes the, the uh, symptoms may be worsened by tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, and also embolic complications through atrial fibrillation. The etiology of mitral, fibrillation, uh, mitral stenosis, usually rheumatic valve disease, though this incidence has been reducing in the industrialized world, two-thirds of the patients are female. Other seldom causes are post-endocarditis states, congenital abnormalities, carcinoids, systemic lupus erythematosus, morbus whipple, Fabry disease, and mucopolysaccharidosis. To explain the pathophysiology of the mitral valve stenosis, the mitral valve fever as a cause causes an inflammatory process that leads to thickening and calcification of the valve. The fusion of the commissures of the leaflet co- causes stenosis. The transmitral diastolic pressure, uh, uh, pressure le- leads to a rise in pressure in the left atrium and a restriction of the left ventricular filling pressure and also the cardiac output. It, as a result of the raised pulmonary venous pressure, this can lead to pulmonary edema. In chronic mitral stenosis, you see it leads to vessel constriction and wall hypertrophy of the pulmonary artery and arterioles with development of pulmonary hypertension and breast heart overload. The atrial dilatation promotes development of atrial fibrillation. Through the fall of the atrial contraction, there is also reduced cardiac output and the risk of development of thrombus and systemic embolism increases. So that's where I stopped in part one. So part two, my question now, how do you connect the mitral valve stenosis with the symptom symptomatic presentation? Well, the flow rate depends on um, sorry, the transmitral gradient depends on the flow rate and the diastolic filling time, which is why symptom developed on either under exertion or with atrial fibrillation. There is actually an exponential relationship between the transvalvular pressure gradient and the mitral flow, as well as the relative good correlation between the mitral valve opening area and the clinical symptoms the patient presents with. The normal mitral valve opening area is 4 to 5 square centimeters. When you have a reduction below 2.5 square centimeters, you expect symptoms. Okay, good. Are there other technical tests that you would want to do? And what special findings do you expect to see? From these technical findings. Well, I would like, would like to do an trans esophageal echocardiography to check for thrombus in the left atrium or the left atrial auricle. I would do an invasive dios- uh, diagnostic right left heart catheterization to see for raised elevated pressure in small circulation. Check for pressure, pressure gradient between pulmonary capillary wedge pressure and the left ventricular filling pressure. You did the transesophageal echocardiography. Here you saw in the right 
a left to right a trom and oracle there were no thrombos but the left a uh, atrium was dilated that's why sinus rhythm you saw is very low flow in the auricles with a uh, doppler flow according to pulse wave doppler 0.2 meters per second the atrial septum was intact without any signs of shunting the mitral valve was significantly thickened with very reduced opening area of about one square centimeter there was mild regurgitation pressure half time 198 meters uh, milliseconds and v max of 2.7 meters per second the walking score was about 14 points which shows that a reconstruction or metal mitral valve uh, valvuloplasty will not bring much my question is, I don't know if you have heard about the Wilkins score. Wilkins is W-I-L-K-I-N with Wilkins score. And my question is, what criteria do you use, do you put into consideration when calculating the Wilkins score? Well, the Wilkins score puts into consideration the mobility, the grade of calcification, the thickness of the valve, and the judgment of the leaflets. Okay, the next question is, do you still need the invasive diagnostic? Well, to grade the valvular stenosis, when you have a very, very uh, representative echocardiography findings, may not be necessary. But if you have discrepancy between the clinical presentation and the echocardiographic finding, you may need to do it. Also, level cardiography and coronal angiography shall be needed if you need to operate on this patient, especially in young patients. Okay, you did the invasive diagnostic in the level cardiography in two uh, biplanar. You saw an enlarged left ventricle with normal function, 60% ejection fraction. There were no relevant contractility disturbances. There were no relevant mitral regurgitation. In the right heart catheterization, you saw a severe pulmonary hypertension with systemic pressure of systolic diastolic mean 143.65 in the pc m to v wave you had 30 to 40 and the calculated opening area was 0 0.7 square centimeters in the selective coronary angiography uh, well the left led was normal the main stem was normal the descending branch of the the descending branch showed some well, uh, irregularities. The second front, second flex branch also shows some wall irregularity and the distal 30% stenosis. The right had, uh, the right coronary artery had no stenosis. So my question is, which therapy options do you have in this patient with mitral valve stenosis? Well. The answer is in patients with mitral valve stenosis. You could give diuretica in atrial fibrillation. You give frequent um, heart rate control, either with digitalis, calcium antagonist, and beta blocker, and they will meet an atrial fibrillation. You could do also also a patient with sinus rhythm. They may also need atrial um, anticoagulation. They may also need a valvuloplasty and also valve reconstruction or valve replacement. So that, those are the four. Let me repeat it. Medication, that is diuretics. And in case of atrial fibrillation, the digitalis, calcium antagonist and beta blockers. Two, anticoagulation also in sinus rhythm with, if you have had an emboli, embolization. Three, valvuloplasty and four, valve replacement or valve reconstruction so now my question now is could you name the indication for a valvuloplasty well valvuloplasty let me give you two conditions one in symptomatic patients that is new york heart association two to four when the opening area is less than 1.5 cubic uh, square centimeter and the, the valve morphology is adequate or good for the valvuloplasty this is a class one indication 
But number two, if you have asymptomatic patient with valve opening area less than 1.5 square centimeter, and they have pulmonary apartation at rest more than 50 millimeters of mercury pulmonary artery pressure, or under exertion more than 60 millimeters of mercury, that is class one indication also. So in symptomat, in fact, most any patient that has more than one point less than 1.5 cubic centimeter. If you are symptomatic and your valve is good, you need, you can have a valvuloplasty. If you are asymptomatic and you have pulmonary hypertension with a pressure more than 50 millimeters at rest or a pressure more than 60 millimeters under exertion, you need a valvuloplasty. Now, the contraindication to valvuloplasty is what I'm going to talk about now. The contraindication is when you have irrelevant associated mitral valve insufficiency with or without an unfavorable valve morphology. Okay, my next question is, could you tell me how you carry out this valvuloplasty you have been talking about? In this case, you have to bring the pigtail catheter into the left ventricle, as well as the right heart catheter in the pulmonary artery, so that you can calculate the transmitral gradient and the valve opening area, as well as the level cardiogram to judge the mitral regurgitation. After a transeptal puncture, the INOA, INOA means I-N-O-U-E, the INO balloon catheter will be placed in the left atrium. And after passing the left, uh, the mitral valve, the balloon will be inflated. There were, thereafter, there will be a repeat registration of the transmitral gradient the valve opening area as well as the mitral insufficiency a regurgitation what are the results you expect for a successful mitral valve valvuloplasty well after a successful mitral valvuloplasty on the average i expect a doubled mitral valve opening area as well as a 50 to 60 percent rise um, reduction in the transvalvular gradient the mortality lies below 1% and the success rate is between 80 to 95%. Are there any complications of the mitral valve loplasty? Could you name them? Well, in 2%, 2 to 10% of cases, you may have a new mitral valve regurgitation which may be relevant and may require operation. Two, you may have a res relevant residual a septum defect, but this is less than 5% of cases. And three, you may have embolic complications. So thank you very much. You have given us enough about the mitral valve voloplasty. Now let's go to the mitral valve reconstruction or replacement. What are the indications for mitral valve reconstruction or replacement? One, patients with mitral valve stenosis with opening area less than 1.5 square centimeters that are symptomatic New York Heart Association 3 and 4 that are not fit for the valvuloplasty. Two, symptomatic patients as from New York Heart Association 2 with severe mitral valve stenosis less than 1.0 square centimeter and with severe pulmonary hypertension of more than 60 millimeters of mercury. And what valves are you going to rec what kind of valves are you going to recommend? Well, generally mechanical valves. Thank you very much.